same pattern you'll hear from all of the collections. This is how museum collections operate. They, they have artifacts, which are these specimens, just like libraries have books. They have librarians, like Arnold and I, who we sort of care for them and make sure that they're given the best care they can so that generations from now they'll still be in the same condition they were uh, as much as possible when they were collected. And the main reason he was so successful at discovering coral reef fishes is he was one of the first, if not the first, ichthyologists to use this brand new invention in the 1940s called scuba. And that allowed him to actually enter the environment of the fishes, whereas his predecessors had had to rely on traps and trawls and other things. There's one in a museum in Brazil, maybe something in Dakar, um, Indonesia, has one. It's been found all over the world. The, the, the Megamouth list uh, hosted on Wikipedia as well as Florida Museum of Natural History. I think number 50 would count today. We're in the Castle Memorial Building in addition to our PCMB lab where we're headed now. This is also where the museum's cultural collections and all of ethnology are housed. <laughs> We've worked on um, rare and endangered species from uh, farming lands, so they're required to protect their rare and endangered species that keep on their, their premises. Uh, it's not really that exciting, but hey. <laughs> I love it. We think it is. Stuck dry ice in there before and then gone to rummage around and find things and I've almost fallen in from almost passing out. Oh, no. <laughs> that wasn't very smart. But, um, <laughs> Collect, study, and record as much, not only um, natural history specimens, and but also the culture. Able to get the tentacles, the stingy tentacles from Portuguese man of war, and they stick it on the themselves as protection. Other times they'll sting the prey and then eat it. So he's, he has different, he shows different methods that the cone shark can actually kill and stuff. So uh, my name is Nuri Yang, and uh, I actually started with the evolution and systematics of seabirds. So Sheila Conant at the University of Hawaii was my advisor. Um, but I was always interested in biodiversity, pathways, and evolution. Um, okay, I have, um, you know, um, undergrads from other islands and even the mainland that just still write and says, I hate you, Nori, I'm going hiking back in line, you know, tell and I'm seeing snails everywhere. <laughs> just getting that sight image of knowing that's dirt and that's a shell. And so now what we're doing is applying new techniques to some of our existing collections in order to learn more. So what we've done today, this is our, our lab, um, we have pulled just a couple of couple of objects for you, we put them out in cases. The first are fish hooks, and as you can see, a lot of these are fragmented. A lot of what we deal with is the rubbish, right? Mm -hmm. Things left behind by people. So we have beautiful, um, complete objects, so complete fish hooks, but we have a lot of rejects, or broken fish hooks, or fragments, or objects that were never finished, right? Yes, so we also include um, precise insects, Arachnida, which are spiders and scorpions. Oh, yeah. see the eye? Oh my goodness. The head's tilted. Wow. My favorite is the deadly butterfly. Wow. So that's oh, this. Oh my gosh. Right? So this wow. is the dorsal, the front. When it's upside down, or when its wings are closed, it looks like a leaf. So they've taken this camouflage to a whole different level. Um, so these are the microscope slides. Very cool. Where are they? Collection. Who writes these little... Uh, I was about to say. Yeah. Who's got that little handwriting? So we use 0 .005 Figma pens, or we use point, or 3.5 font size. So when we get the carcasses in, a lot of them have been necropsied by the National Wildlife Center here. Um, so they've already been kind of cut open and had a lot of their organs removed. Um, sometimes we get whole specimens, um, but less often. And so we have a lab across the street. If we had more time, I'd take you guys over there. So that's where all the gross stuff happens. And then we'll take out most of the skeleton. and um, We try to get out as much of the blood and the grease as we can. We take the <coughs> eyes and the brain out. And then we just wrap cotton around a stick, um, use cotton for the eyes and to replace um, 
the brain and then we sew it up. So yeah. here are the Oyo. Oh, as you can see, there's a lot of variation in these guys. So we're getting all of these ready to be installed in the collection. They've already been frozen for three weeks because everything that comes in here is frozen for three weeks. In fact, I'd kind of like to freeze you guys. <laughs> to benefit, I work on amphibians and reptiles, and so this is what they look like. You can see this is the Indonesian side of New Guinea, rather poorly known compared to this side. And this is mainly our activities, actually. The government uh, is very worried about the protecting the Kokoda track. And so they concocted a, a scheme that ended up with a designation of this area here in green called the Interim Protection Zone. Why would you collect herbariums, uh, plant specimens, and put them in a herbarium? What would be the reason for that? Uh, lots of reasons. Uh, one would be historical value. And my first specimen here is a specimen that was collected on uh, Captain Cook's third voyage. And uh, there were only two of this plant on that islet, none found anywhere else. Of those two plants, I believe they have, as of recently, they are both dead. No longer there. there are. I really encourage people to come in and use the herbarium because I kind of feel like if people aren't using this place, what, what good is it? You know, it's, This isn't our ivory tower up here. I want people coming in and using it. So,